A Lesson Before Dying, Chapter 19 It was cold and it rained for the two weeks preceding our Christmas program. It rained too much for the people to go out into the field to cut cane. And the field and the roads were too muddy for the cane to be brought to the derrick for loading and then shipment to the mill for grinding. People stayed at home around the fireplace or near the stove in the kitchen. You could, say, you could see gray-blue smoke rising from the big chimneys in the fronts of the houses and from the smaller chimneys in the backs. And because the wind always came into the quarter from the river this time of year, you could see the smoke drifting from the quarter back across the field toward the cemetery in the swamp. The only time you were likely to see someone out in the yard was to cut more wood to throw onto the fireplace or put into the kitchen stove. The rest of the time, the quarter was deserted. The doors and windows shut tight against the cold wind and the rain. There was still a light drizzle on the night of the program, but it did not keep the people away. I had told the students that this program should be dedicated to Jefferson and that they had taken the message home and many people who had never attended a Christmas or graduation program came to the church that night. The program began at 7 o'clock, but people were there much earlier. Because of the rain, they could not drive cars in the quarter, so they either walked or came by wagon. Reverend Ambrose, who lived up the river and not on the plantation, parked his car along the highway and walked to the church. As usual, he was dressed in a dark suit, white shirt, and dark tie, but tonight he also wore a yellow slicker. Most of the other people wore their going-to-town clothes, not their everyday working clothes, and not their Sunday best either. Going-to-town clothes were old clothes, but without any visible patches. The shirts and the dresses may have been faded, but they were clean and they were neat. No one lingered outside as they would have had the weather even better. And after scraping off their shoes on the bottom step, they kicked the mud on the ground and came inside the church. The woman folks who had brought food set their pots or pans or bowls on the tables that we had placed against the blackboards in the back. And Mrs. Sarah James, who had arrived at 6.30, sat guarding the food until after the program when everyone would eat. The other woman took vacant seats as close to the heater as they could get. The men and the older boys stood in the back talking until the woman folks told them to sit down. I was behind the curtain with the students who had been chosen to participate in the Christmas play. The curtain was made up of four bedsheets, suspended from a wire that extended from one side of the church to the other. Three of the sheets were very white. The fourth was a light gray. This one belonged to Miss Rita Lawrence, and as long back as I could remember, she had insisted on contributing something to the Christmas program, and every time it was a sheet, probably the same one, and it was never as white as the others. The audience always knew which sheet was Miss Rita's, and they thought it was embarrassing to have it hanging up there with all the others, but no one had the courage to speak to Miss Rita about it, and each year it was one of the four that made up the curtain. Irene Cole and Odessa Freeman were assisting me in preparing the students behind the curtain. The two shepherds wore brown croaker sacks over their dress clothes, and each of them carried a tall pam bamboo cane curved at the top and tied with black thread. The three wise men wore cray paper robes. The robes were red, green, and yellow. Irene and Odessa continued to remind the wise men to be careful not to tear their robes by moving around so much. Mary, the mother of Jesus, wore a wrinkled blue denim dress to show that she was a poor woman. Joseph, her husband, had on overalls and carried a hammer in the loop of his pants. Baby Jesus was a white alabaster doll dressed in a long white gown. The girls in their choir wore white dresses, the boys white shirts. Every so often I would part the curtain to see how many people had come in. Miss Rita Lawrence and her big grandson Bach were two of the first people there and sat up front with Bach taking up almost a third of the bench. Twice Bach had been sent to the mental institution at Jackson, but the doctors there knew he wasn't dangerous and felt that they could do no more for him than Miss Rita probably could do for him at home. And after keeping him a week or two, they sent him back to her. Bach had one peculiarity, other than being unable to look after himself, and that was his love for marbles. He carried them with him all the time. He sat there now playing with the marbles in the right pocket of his overalls. Miss Rita occasionally had to touch him on the hand to keep them quiet. On the bench with Bach and Miss Rita sat Julia Livonia, who had two children in the program. The boy is one of the shepherds, and the girl is Mary, mother of Jesus. James, her husband, was not there, a short, big-headed mulatto with curly black hair and gray eyes, and he had told me once that he had better things to do than go to a coon gathering. 
but Julia was there, and I knew that she had brought pecan and coconut pralines just as she did every year. The Freemans had come in, too. Joe Freeman sat far in the back, but his wife Harriet and her mother, Aunt Agnes, and several of the children were up front, directly behind Miss Rita Bach and Julia Livonia. The Coles, Irene's people, sat behind them. Norman and his wife, Sarah, Sarah's mother, Lelia Wells, Sarah's sister, Esther, and Esther's boyfriend, Henry, and two or three children. Sarah usually brought crackling and baked sweet potatoes to the Christmas program. On the other side of the aisle, in the front row, and still wearing their overcoats because they were far from the heater, sat my aunt and Miss Emma, Miss Eloise Bowie, and Inez. And behind them were Pharrell Giraud and his little wife, Ophelia. Ophelia was a delicate mulatto woman whose sisters came to the plantation every Sunday morning to take her to the Catholic Church in Bayonne. She would return late in the evening, and we would hardly see her again until the next Sunday, when she would climb into the back of the car to go to Mass. I supposed it was her husband, Pharrell, who got her out tonight, because she had never come before. Behind them sat most of the Martin family, about ten of them, most but not all. The father, Herbert, was not there, and neither was the idiot boy, Jesse, or the pregnant daughter, Vera, or the old grandmother. But Viola, the mother, was there, along with eight or nine of her children. Two others were in the choir behind the curtain, and the Williamses were there, four of them. Three Ruffins, mother, son, and daughter, were there. The Griffins, Harry and Lena, with their two grown-up unmarried daughters, Alberta and Luberta. So the church was nearly full, and it was only a quarter to seven. The bad weather had not kept them away, but probably had brought them out tonight, since they couldn't work in the field or in their gardens, and they had no reason to stay at home claiming to be tired. At seven o'clock, I parted the curtains and stepped out to face the audience. I told them how happy that the children and I were, were there to see them here tonight, and that I knew that they would enjoy the program because their children had worked so hard the past weeks to make it a success. I invited Reverend Ambrose, who sat in one of the side pews, to lead us in prayer. He stood and asked all to stand and bow their heads. The Lord's Prayer was first. Then he thanked God for letting us see a brand new day and for allowing us to gather together in his house in such inclement weather. The minister was a small man and seemed timid, but he did possess a strong, demanding voice when he prayed. He asked God to go with all the sick and afflicted, both at home and in hospitals across the land. He asked God to visit the jail cells all over the land, and especially in Bayonne, and to go with the guilty and the innocent. He asked God to go with all those here tonight who did not know him in the pardon of their sins and thought that they did not need him. No matter how educated a man was, he meant me, though he didn't call me by name, he too was locked in a cold, dark cell of ignorance if he did not know God in this pardon of his sins. He closed by beseeching God to look down upon this humble little church and bless this gathering. The people responded with amen and sat back down. My aunt said, Amen, louder than anyone, and she was looking directly at me. I went behind the curtain and, taking one of the middle sheets, while a student did the same on the other side, pulled the curtain back to reveal the stage. The choir of a dozen boys and girls moved down below the altar to sing Silent Night. Irene Cole directed them, and I stood behind the gathered curtain on the right so that I could watch both the choir and the audience. The children had worked hard, and they sang beautifully, and this, too, was due to the bad weather. At any other time, they would have had to go home to work in the field or around the house, but since the weather had been so inclement, to use one of Reverend Ambrose's words, they had had more time for practice. The audience appreciated the singing, even those who did not respond with amen, amen, and gave the choir their closest attention. So did Bach. Once he raised his hand to point, a sign to show how affected he was by the singing. But Miss Rita took the hand gently and brought it to his knee. She kept her hand on his, not pressing it, but comforting him. After silent night, the choir sang, O Little Town of Bethlehem, and my eyes left the audience. And I looked at the little pine tree, stuck in the tub of dirt, decorated with strips of red and green cray paper and bits of lint cotton and streamers of tinsel and little white cardboard star on its highest branch. And under the tree, and propped against the tub, was one lone gift. Wrapped in red paper and tied with a green ribbon and with a red and green bow, the children had contributed nickels, dimes, quarters, money that they had made from picking pecans, and Irene Odessa and Odile James had gone to Baton Rouge and bought a wool sweater and a pair of wool socks. 
The people sitting up front could see the package, and they knew who it was for. And at times I could see their eyes shifting from the choir toward the tree, and I could see the change in their expressions. But Jingle Bells, a gayer and livelier song than the previous two, brought everyone's attention back to the choir, and I could catch in people's faces relief from their thoughts. Odessa Freeman's Twas the Night Before Christmas followed, and it was more than a simple recitation. It was a dramatic performance. In her long white dress with long sleeves and with her black hair recently straightened and shining, combed back and tied with a white silk ribbon, and her body swaying and her arms spread out one moment, then closed so that the palms of her hands came together, and her voice rising to fill the church and then falling to a whisper so that you could barely hear. Odessa not only made you see the room where the stockings were hung, but she enabled you to hear the reindeer on the roof and hear Santa before you saw him come down the chimney to fill the stockings. You heard him call the name of each reindeer after ascending the chimney, and you actually watched the reindeer going to the next house in the quarter. It was so real that Bach felt it too and pointed again, and Miss Rita nodded that she understood his feeling, and she drew back the hand and placed it on his knee and kept her own hand on his to comfort him. Following the poem came an essay, The Little Pine Tree, written and read by Albert H. Martin III. He told all the other Christmas trees over the years of oak and of cypress and of strange bushes that could not be named. He told of how the trees had been cut in the pasture and dragged back to the quarter and how the girls had washed the leaves to make the tree presentable. Then he came to the little pine tree. Not a great tree. It was not tall and not blessed with great limbs, but it was pine. And it was the most beautiful of all the Christmas trees. The little pine tree even took on a character of its own. It was so happy to be here. And while he spoke, Albert Martin III gestured toward the tree. And everybody looked at the tree and at the single gift underneath it. Hark, the herald angels sing came next and led into the nativity scene. As the song ended, two shepherds in their croaker sack robes came on stage behind the choir. The shepherds were attending their flock when suddenly a light appeared on the back wall under the pictures of Christ and Reverend Ambrose. The light came from a flashlight held by a student from stage right. Shepherd 1 pointing. A star in the east. Shepherd 2. And so bright. Shepherd 1. What does it mean? Shepherd 2. I wish I knowed. And Shepherd 1 looked at Shepherd 2 as if he were about to correct his grammar but changed his mind, and no one in the audience seemed to have noticed. Three wise men enter from stage right, dressed in red, green, and yellow robes of cray paper, and several people in the audience snickered and made comments. Shepherd 1 said, Wise men, they can tell us. Shepherd 2, Well, tell us, old wise men, what yon star mean. Wise man 1, It shines down on Bethlehem. And wise man two said, Little town of Bethlehem. Wise man three, We must go to Bethlehem. And they all look at the star, and the star moved a little as if the person holding the flashlight was getting tired. And shepherd one said, But what it mean? And wise man one, In time you will know. And shepherd two, How are we going to know? And wise man one, He'll let us know. And shepherd one, God on high, and wise man one, works in mysterious ways. The light moved again as if the person was changing hands or giving the flashlight to someone else to hold. And wise man two, wonders to perform. And shepherd two said, but we ain't nothing but poor little old shepherds. Wise man one, the lowest and highest in his eyes. And wise man two, let us be off to yon Bethlehem. And the wise men leave stage right. Shepherd one said, Brightest star I ever seen. And shepherd two, Well, got to mean something. And the star dipped down and came back, and shepherd one looked at the person holding the light and looked back at me to be sure that I had seen it too. Shepherd one, Let us kneel down. Nothing will bother the flock tonight. And the shepherds kneel as the curtain closes. And the curtain opens immediately afterwards. And we see Mary sitting on a bench holding baby Jesus. Joseph stands beside her looking down upon the baby and a hammer hangs from Joseph's overall loop. Off stage right, people are heard approaching. The star points yon. We're close now. Yon, yon, the stable. And the three wise men enter from stage right and immediately kneel down before Mary and baby Jesus. 
surely he come. And he's nodding. It's him, all right. Our Savior. We bring three gifts, O Lord, and they each place a penny on the bench beside Mary. And Mary says, My little baby? A Savior? And nodding, the wise man says, Your little baby. And Mary says happily, My little baby. And she holds him up to Joseph. Look, Joseph, my little baby, a Savior. Joseph nods but does not speak. Mary, rocking baby Jesus in her arms, begins to sing joy to the world, the Lord has come. And the wise men stand and join her, and so does Joseph, and the shepherds in the choir, and all the others, including the boy who had held the flashlight. As the song ends, they all bow to the audience. And when the children remained on stage, I asked Reverend Ambrose if he had any last remarks. Again, he thanked God for allowing so many people to come out tonight, and again he reminded us that we were not all saved from sin. Even with book learning, we were still fools if we did not have God in our hearts. And again, he asked God to go with those locked up in the prison cells, and he thanked God for all his blessings. And the congregation responded with, Amen, Amen, Amen. I thanked the minister and told the congregation that that was our program for this year. And I reminded them that there were refreshments in the back. The children waited on stage to hear what I thought of the program, and I told them that it was fine, just fine. And the children left the stage to get in line for food. Do you want me to bring you something, Mr. Wiggins? Irene asked me. No, thanks, I said. Something the matter, Mr. Wiggins? No, why? I said. Well, you don't look too happy. I'm okay, I said. Go on and get something to eat. Irene left to get in line, but she looked back at me over her shoulder. She was right. I was not happy. I had heard the same carols all my life. I had seen the same little play with all the same mistakes and grammar, and the minister had offered the same prayer as always, Christmas or or Sunday. The same people wore the same old clothes and sat in the same places, and next year it would be the same, and the year after the same again. Vivian said things were changing, but where were they changing? I looked back at the people around the tables talking, eating, drinking their coffee and lemonade, but I was not with them. I stood alone. I saw one of the little Herbert girls coming up the aisle toward me, balancing a napkin of food on both her hands, and she had to pass by the tree before reaching the pulpit. She watched the food all the time to be sure that she did not drop anything. Miss Luce, bring you this. Thanks, Gloria. I sat on a chair inside the pulpit eating fried chicken and bread and the people were still laughing and talking and just outside the pulpit was the little pine tree, the little pine Christmas tree with its green and red stripes of cray paper for lights, its bits of lit cotton for snow and the narrow strings of tinsel for icicles and there was the lone gift against the tub of dirt.